we looked at the length of God's love in relation to time. Because the Bible led us to look at it in relation to time. That's not the only aspect of the length of God's love. The length of God's love is even more than time. While we look at it through the window of the fact that his love existed from eternity past just for you and that it will exist in eternity in the future just for you. And we looked at the fact that because of his love, his forgiveness and his willingness to suffer untold suffering extends over thousands of years. Which is why the Bible calls it long-suffering. And yet, that's not the only aspect of the length of God's love. We, we haven't even scratched the surface. Sometimes we feel like, oh, we're starting to dig. Finally, we've left the surface of the sea and now we've gotten into a submarine. Well, actually, we've still got our snorkels on, friends. We haven't even put some scuba gear on yet. And we're not going to during this meeting, these meetings. But I want to impress you with the fact that we have not even begun to understand the depths of what God wants to teach us. The depths are much deeper than what any human can take you. And the Holy Spirit can teach you in a moment what it takes another person a lifetime to learn. That's why Bible study is now the most urgent of all of our needs. A reform in Bible study is the most urgent of all of our needs. This is what the messenger of God tells us. So we find interesting things like this where we're looking at the dimensions, the four dimensions of God's love and we realize this is another way that I can really dig into God's word and I can learn so many new things. And we saw the length. We didn't have time yesterday to look at the breadth of God's love. But we did mention two days ago in the morning that that breadth has to do with nations, peoples. Because remember Job chapter 11 told us that God's love is broader than what? The sea broader than the sea and in Revelation 17 verse 15 the sea represents peoples multitudes nations tongues so God's love takes in all cultures and while the world in its political correctness is starting to segregate in many ways and even ages have been segregated for decades if you look at all of the segregations that are happening across the world today it has to do with the breadth of God's love even the fact that adults don't spend so much time with children anymore. Parents spend an average of two hours a week with their children. Quality time. This is an average among Western nations. Two hours of quality time. The teachers at school are the ones who spend more time fairly level with their friends. And by beholding, we become changed. changed. So when we think of God's love being broader than the sea, it takes in everybody, all age groups, all nationalities, all needs, all struggles. God's love takes in every person that needs him. But if it's broader than, what does that mean? It's even more than that. It's even more than those who live on this planet. Now the book of Ephesians tells us that God made worlds, plural. There are other beings watching this. There are also unfallen angels who are watching the great controversy played out on this planet. And as they watch, God's love is toward them. He wants them to understand for the rest of eternity. He wants them to know his love because of the lies that Satan has spread about God now we know the angels have seen enough evidence we know they've seen plenty and it's just humans that need to come to our final decision especially God's people 
And we don't have time to dig in uh, deeply to the breadth. Today we're focusing on the height and the depth of God's love. We began in the three angels' messages because this is what the three angels' messages is about. It's about the love of God. Because if we have His love for ourselves, for others, and for God, if we have that kind of love, and if we have God's hatred for sin and Satan and self, then we will be overcomers. So we're looking for two things. We want God's love for righteousness and God's hatred for sin. And only he can give that as a gift. We can't make it happen. I'm so thankful that God has shown us in his word the way of the transgressor is hard. And yet God tells us through his messenger, it's easy living once you are dead. I love that phrase. It's, it's a great one to have up above your doorway to your house, your entrance door. It's easy living once you're dead. You'll get questions, I guarantee you. You'll get interest. Put it on your t-shirt. Someone's going to ask you sometime, what do you mean? And God can use that as, as a witness. But you'll notice that in the three angels' messages, especially, let's turn to Revelation 14, verse 12, and you will notice something we mentioned from the first morning of our study, and this has to do with the patience of the saints. <clears throat> It is the love of God, which we saw before, the love of God that will actually give us the patience of the saints. If we don't have patience to endure the trials we deal with now, family, work, the challenges, the temptations of life, it's because we need the love of God. God's love makes patience happen. Now, in Peter's letter... There's something that comes before patience. Does anybody know the quality in the, step, in the steps to heaven? Peter wrote a whole lot of steps. What comes before patience? Temperance. Another beautiful phrase says, it is impossible for an intemperate man to be a patient man. Sometimes people try so hard to overcome a certain sin in their life when they don't realize God has given us steps that are required and if we neglect the first steps, we won't find strength for the next steps until we go back to what God already showed us. And if we be temperate, our nerves come under control, the agitation of the nerves goes away and victory comes. There are people who have prayed and prayed and prayed and said, why isn't God helping me? And you go back to their lifestyle and very quickly you find, well, here you go. And I know we can all relate. But we must think about these things and be ready to, to allow God to change it. What does it say, Revelation 14, 12? Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that? Keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. So if we are going to keep a hold of the faith of Jesus Christ, if we are going to keep a hold of the commandments of God and not let them go from our heart, from our thoughts, our words, if God's going to control our whole life, it requires patience. Let's come back to Galatians chapter 6 and let's find out what God has to say about the height and the depth of his love. Galatians chapter 6 verse 9, the Bible says, Let us not be weary in what? Well doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Now the Bible says, let us not be weary in well doing. Righteousness, holiness. If you look at Galatians chapter 5, there are over 10 definitions for righteousness by faith. 
And among those definitions, it gives this description of continuing in walking and running in the Christian life, not giving up, in revealing the fruits of the Spirit. And so among those 10 definitions of righteousness by faith, back there in in chapter 5, we see that God is wanting to show us how can we not become weary? Because that's what happens. That's why people sin. Because we become weary in well-doing. How can we not faint? How can we not become weary? We want the Bible to show us. Today we're going to have a, a Bible study. And we're going to allow God to show us from His Word step by step. Because the Bible must be its own interpreter. We must allow God to show us how can we experience the power of Jesus in our life. What is the length, the height and depth of his love? So when we realize that God doesn't want us to become weary in well-doing, my question is, how? How? I want God to show me. How do I not become... Because that verse just says, don't become weary. Okay, we've tried and we've failed many times. But what is God's plan? Because God's plan doesn't fail. So let's come back to Isaiah 40 verse 31 and let's see what God's plan is for... or God's remedy for failure. There is a balm in Gilead, friends. There is healing for you and I today. In Isaiah 40, verse 31, such a common verse, so well known, we could just about all repeat it. Now, what did the Bible say? Let us not become weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Now, the Bible says, but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall what? Run and not be what? Weary. They shall walk and not faint. So tell me, from this Bible verse, we're seeking God's leading in our life, right? We're studying and digging deeper. What is it that will stop you from becoming weary and fainting in your mind? According to this Bible verse. Waiting on the Lord. So now I'm asking God, okay, that helps me a little bit, but it's not enough. I need practical. I need very clear instruction where to go and what I'm looking for and I'm asking God to show me how do I wait on you Lord what does it mean to wait on God and so I study the word wait all through the Bible and we come to Micah chapter 7 and this is such a lovely verse because Micah chapter 7 and verse 7 gives us the perfect numbers easy to remember Micah 7 verse 7, how do we wait for God? The Bible says, therefore I will look unto the Lord, I will do what? Wait for the God of my salvation, my God will hear me. Now using Hebrew parallelism, where the writers, the prophets of those times would say a phrase and then they would repeat it in different words. Using that understanding of the Hebrew, what's another way to wait for God? according to this verse, is to look. I will look unto the Lord. It says it right there, doesn't it? No human addition there. That's right there in the text. I will look to the Lord. The Bible must teach us. It has to be the Bible teaching us because men will mislead us. Even if somebody is preaching the truth, but if we make them our God, they will mislead us. Not that they will, but our view of them will mislead us. You know, the Bible says, trust not in the arm of flesh because the arm of flesh might fail you. Is that what it says? Will fail you. Yes. So we've we've got more detail now. We know that the way to wait for God is to look to Him. And that's helping us a lot. It's helping us to 
to start to understand a bit better. <clears throat> and I find that Bible study is one of the most powerful ways to, to do this. Because what happens in Bible study is it does take a bit of patience and perseverance to find answers. Sometimes the subject you're looking for, you may spend an hour or two studying the Bible earnestly. And you might not find the thing that you were really hoping to get the answer for. And you may not even find a gem that grabs you. And you might not even do that in your second day of Bible study or your third day or the fourth day, or the fifth day, or the second week, or the third week. And Jesus is asking you, will you persevere with me? Because I'm actually laying building blocks in your subconscious that you don't even know about. Just trust me, and stay with me, and don't give up. Jacob, it's a bit like prayer, real prayer that leads us to repentance. We sense, I've prayed long enough today. I've prayed long enough for forgiveness. It's a bit like Jacob. Jesus said, you've prayed long enough, Jacob. Stop. What did Jacob say? No. That's not right, Jesus. I haven't prayed long enough. I will not let you go except you bless me. So it's interesting that often when we sort of feel like, well, that's as much as I can do, it's so easy to start to neglect that Bible study, that prayer time, or to say, well, that was long enough. No, it's, it's not. We have to go beyond where we feel like it was enough. The feelings mislead us. And impressions can mislead us. And as we saw with Jacob, even God himself said to Jacob, it's enough. Like he said to Moses, out of the way, Moses, I will kill them all. What did Moses say? No. You can take my name out of the book of life if you have to. I don't believe God would have killed them all. Just like I don't believe he was planning to kill Isaac. But these tests are such a blessing if you look at the fruit of them afterward so if we keep our eyes on Jesus in the word of God it's going to have an amazing impact in our life it actually brings us to the point that we start to find gems after quite a time of persevering where it sort of started to feel like you know it's just not happening what, what's more exciting for you is it when you just get something given to you or when you've worked really hard for a long, long time and then you get the reward. What's better for you? And f first one, getting something really fast. No, you didn't work for it. Nothing. Is that really better? Or hands up those who uh, you've worked really hard and then you get the reward. Is that better? Have you sensed that in life? I've sensed it. It's real. It happens. It's not just for children, even though our children need to be learning that at a very young age. Reward comes from work. <clears throat> but how? How do you look to him? Okay, through Bible study. You can take a word in the concordance. You can study through the Bible and learn so much. That's great. But what does the Bible say? Because God put that word look in there for a reason and my question is what does God say about the word look it doesn't matter what I say or anybody else what does God say how does God say to look to him where does God say to look to him very important thing that we must understand our youth are looking for God One of our youth here has been struggling with the decision between becoming a professional sports person or staying with the Sabbath. Right on the verge of just throwing the Sabbath out. And as we've been looking to Jesus and 
God has been sending speakers in to come and share with them. Meet in due season and people to relate to them. This young man, I asked him, I said, did, did you get enough of an answer to your question? And he said, I know what I need. I need the Sabbath to be what it's supposed to be. I need the, the Sabbath to be what it's never been for me. Now I know that. You know, friends, if, if we can look to Jesus, things do change. If we can see him as he is, things really change. And we as a church family need it to happen among us. We, we can't just be hearing beautiful things and not have change. There must be change at the ground level. We've got to go out of our comfort zone beyond where we're comfortable and bring that change. And there are people who aren't ready to do Bible study. Particular young lady that we were working with in the youth care center. Not ready to hear about God. If you could hear the stories that she went through. The tears that we shed listening. Because she had never told anybody what her own father and other people had done to her. And in her pain and suffering, she couldn't imagine that a God could exist. But we started to connect with her. We started to allow her to look to Jesus the way she could, through someone else. Be kind, be nice, be friendly, be challenging. And here's another way to see Jesus, to be taken out of your comfort zone. To go beyond where you think you can go. Did you know that your Christian life is supposed to be out of your comfort zone every day? Because if you're a Christian, that means Jesus is living in you and he's living his life in you. And he's supernatural. So he's not only going to do what you can do, because you can do that with you, by yourself. If you're just living a life you can live in your own strength, what's that? That's just self. But the daily Christian life is a life where you are revealing a power. You are experiencing things that you could never do. That's true righteousness by faith. That's where Jesus is in charge of our life. And so as this young lady began to drink in friendship and kindness, she, she began to say, you know, I... There's something about this. And I said, I, I've got a book I'd like you to read called The Ministry of Healing. A couple of weeks later, I said, how's it going? She said, I finished. I thought, wow. You know how the Bible speaks of, because the Jews had this attitude, the heathen are dogs and God's people are the righteous. And in the book of Proverbs, verse 28, it says they're bold as lions. It's like you've got lions and dogs. They just seem so different. But sometimes it's like the lions are less appreciative of the truth than the dogs. It's like we have so much feast in front of us. And what are we doing with it? Sorry? Sometimes we, we're a bit too full. Okay. Maybe we've fallen asleep because there's been too much eating without sharing maybe. It's fascinating to think about these things and to get to the grassroots of human need. You see, friends, we're living in a time now where we don't have time for self anymore. We don't have time to worry about what we want to do. We must be thinking about God and His will and the needs of others. That young lady is attending Adventist Church now and seeking God's will for her life. We can look to God in so many ways. We can see Him in other people as they minister to us. We can see Him in nature, God's second book. One of my favorite things to do is to go hiking and meet up with atheists who just love being in nature. And you just know why. And deep down they know why. Sometimes. 
but I love talking to them. They're beautiful people. And they're in pain, like most of us. So the way to wait on God is to look to Him. To actually turn our eyes to Him. In these different places in the Bible, through other people, witnessing. We meet with Jesus at the bedside of the sick. If we minister to people's needs, if we think about other people, we meet with Jesus. I gave the youth the test during one of our sessions. I didn't have a chair. And I've been encouraged to think about other people. And so I'm standing there and watching, you know, what do people notice? Because I was busy doing what I needed to do, stuck in this corner of the room, and I'd have to go somewhere to find the chair. One of them actually notices a chair outside. And he has sense enough to say, oh, th there's a chair out there. So it was pointing without voicing it at first, just, you know, <laughs> how teenagers do sometimes. And we said, oh, what's happening? Oh, there's a chair out there. I said, oh, good. I said, oh, yeah, it could be good for you. I said, oh, that's nice. Thank you. <laughs> he didn't get it. And we went through a number of interesting sequences. Uh, and I ended up getting my chair. And they still don't know the lesson we're going to learn from it. But, you see, friends, I don't blame him. I'm not saying he's a bad boy. Actually, he's a beautiful young man. And God has a special plan for his life. The lesson is important, though, for all of us. We will see Jesus far better in the Bible if we think more of other people. It's one of the most important ways to see him. However, what we're going to do now is we're going to turn to one last text and we're going to ask God to show us how, where do I practically look to and, and how do I look to God. That text is found in Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. How do I not become weary and faint? How do I keep running and walking? How do I wait on God? When the times are tough and the temptations are impossible, how do I look to God so that actually victory is mine? How do I do that? Hebrews chapter 12, beginning at verse 1. Wherefore, seeing we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us. And let us do what? Run. Run. Did we see that word before? That's part of righteousness by faith. This is Christian living. But what character quality are we to use in order to run? With patience. So we're on the same subject, aren't we, that we started with. This is the quality that will be God's last day people. This is the quality that will take us through the final crisis. If you want to make it through till Jesus comes, here it is. God is telling us to run with patience the race that is set before us. Notice how, verse 2, looking where? Unto Jesus, but doing what? The author and finisher of our faith where did Jesus author our faith someone says heaven anyone else sorry in the womb okay for us personally he began to work on our hearts that's a very important point beautiful the answer is in the context of this chapter we're about to read it so we'll continue on and I'll let the Bible show you. The author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured what? The cross, where he authored our faith. Where did he finish it? What does it say next? Despising the shame and is set down at the right hand of the throne 
of God. So this Bible text is saying, if you look at the two things that God is joining together, he's the author and finisher of our faith. He endured the cross and now he's in heaven. So he, as the author of our faith, he endured the cross. That's where he authored our faith. When we talk about the faith of Jesus that we must have, it's the faith that will trust in God when we feel God has rejected us. That's the faith needed to be ready to meet Jesus. A faith that can hang on even when we feel God is saying, let me go. This is so important. So important. Let me go for the day breaketh. He authored our faith on the cross. And how do we get it? 2 Corinthians 3.18 By beholding the cross of Jesus Christ, watching those closing scenes an hour a day, He will put that within your subconscious mind and He will make it the motivation for the choices you make and the power for victory. But then it says, He's the finisher of our faith and it says where? where he is set at the right hand of the throne of God, which now is in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. So where do we look to Jesus, according to this Bible text? Much of the Christian world will tell you, the cross, brother, that's it. It was all done at the cross. Look to Jesus there, that's, it's done. And everybody was justified there, and it's all over. All we have to do is believe it and know it and we're going to heaven. What does the Bible say? Where else do we need to look to him? In the sanctuary in heaven. Study the sanctuary message like never before. Because there is the height of God's love. Remember, God's love is as high as heaven. And that's where the height of God's love is, is revealed and demonstrated. In what God is doing for us. Where Jesus is interceding, where he ever lives. Is it Hebrews 7, 25? Where Christ ever liveth to make intercession for us. He's pleading for us there. He's given his entire life. He's revealing the struggle. The struggle Jesus has there now for our souls. He's revealing what he's been doing for us for 6,000 years. He didn't just experience the cross in that moment of the cross as we've already seen during these studies. Jesus actually has been going through the struggle of the cross for 6,000 years. And that's what the sanctuary message shows you. So what the sanctuary message does is it protects you from just thinking the cross was just a moment of time. Yes, that was the visible demonstration to us Yes, that was the event that did take place and had to take place. But it was showing us what God has been experiencing for that long. And there is the height of God's love. And the depth of God's love? Well, we saw it's deeper than what? Deeper than hell. In Job 11, it says it's deeper than hell. And that word hell is the grave. And Jesus went to the cross and he died for us. But he didn't just stop there. Jesus died the second death. You know there's a difference. He didn't just go to hell. He went deeper. Because he doesn't want us to have to go there, you know. What else can he do? He's done everything he can. Everything. Because the Bible uses the phrase that he poured out his blood. That he pours out his soul. If you look in the sanctuary service, the priest put the blood in a bowl and then how much of the blood went into the sanctuary or on the horns of the altar? sprinkles what happened to the rest of it it was poured out useless why why was it poured out at the base of the altar 
on the earth. Why? This, this was the rejected blood of Jesus Christ. This was the evidence that God had given everything he could for humanity. He poured himself out and humanity said no. And so his blood, the evidence that he had died for all humanity and given everybody a genuine opportunity was present for the universe and that was necessary for the earth to be cleansed. Could not happen without that. If Jesus only died for those that would be made righteous, the earth could never be cleansed. Study it out, friends. Search the word of God. Jesus has gone deeper. So we don't have to go deeper. Isn't he amazing? And if we think about these things, it, there's a strength that comes into our soul. A, a desire for victory, a hatred of sin. You know, when your best friend is treated badly, or your son, your daughter, or your wife, your husband, and you love them, and they're treated badly, it really hurts. It really hurts. And what God wants to do for us is, He wants us to realize what Jesus has suffered for us. But he wants us to realize what others will suffer if they miss out on heaven. Did you catch that? Jesus wants us to realize what others are going to suffer if they miss out on heaven. Watch this carefully. If we don't see Jesus in other people, look, if we don't see them as important as Jesus, if we don't love them enough to do anything we can to save them, then we're missing that picture. If, if we do see them as our best friends, like a total stranger, but if we've been in the closet with Jesus and we've felt his love and that he's put, us, put that love in our heart for others, then when we meet with him, there's going to be an unquenchable desire to save them in every meeting with every human. Because we can't imagine them being lost. It, it just, it can't happen. We don't want them to face that. If you think of the person in this world that you don't want to be lost more than anybody else, God wants to put that in your heart a thousand times more for them and for everybody else. To make this the great motivation of life. And that's what your youth are waiting for. That's what they're waiting for. And nothing else. So let's finish off here. What does it say? For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself. And he had that love for them, like they were Jesus' best friend. That's the love he had for those who were destroying him. Consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your body. Sorry? Did I miss something? Lest ye be wearied and faint where? In your mind. Is that where the battle is? Is that where we can lose heaven? Is that where we would not be ready for the final crisis? Is that where the three angels' messages center? The battle for the mind. Where are our thoughts? Where are our feelings? What are we trusting? Lest ye become wearied and faint in your mind and what will stop us from becoming weary and fainting in our minds looking where to Jesus where at the cross and 
in the heavenly sanctuary.